fundamentally the old security forces above all, the old KGB. And this is their revenge for their failure to hold the Soviet Union together 30 years ago. It's, it's more complicated than that, but there's a lot of truth to that. And these people are fueled, and Vladimir Putin himself is fueled, uh, by a sort of nostalgia for empire which elites tend to have. I mean, their sense of prestige, their sense of status, their mm. sense of world historical significance. Yeah, Post-imperial conflicts still rage today from Ireland to Cyprus, Iraq to Fiji as well. The breakdown of an empire into a nation state is not an easy process. Dominic Levin, who joins us now, suggests that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a case in point. Dominic is one of the great experts on empires and Russian history and has written a new book, charting the global history of emperors. Dominic, good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. Um, let's, first of all, I suppose, try to understand how much of the aggression that we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment is, is, can be blamed, really, on the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Well, I think to a significant extent it can, and the surprising thing is that less that there is a lot of bloodshed and horror now than that so little actually in the years when the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, this was a sort of modern variant of empire, hugely powerful, multi-multi-ethnic, uh, vast, uh, and its collapse was astonishingly peaceful given the fact that it was a brutal empire with a pretty ferocious uh, tradition of repression. Mm. Uh, so watching it disintegrate with barely a shot fired in its defence was astonishing and did actually feed into some of the illusions in the West about us living in a sort of ever more liberal, ever more progressive and peaceful world. So then with its peaceful uh, disintegration, why aggression now? Partly because... You know, the empire disintegrated peacefully to a great extent because Russia didn't fight to defend it. Mm. On the contrary, Russia helped to undermine and destroy it. What you've had in the last 25 years is gradually re-emerging at the top of Russian power. Fundamentally, the old security forces above all, the old KGB. And this is their revenge for their failure to hold the Soviet Union together 30 years ago. It's, it's more complicated than that, but there's a lot of truth to that. And these people are fueled, and Vladimir Putin himself is fueled, uh, by a sort of nostalgia for empire which elites tend to have. I mean, their sense of prestige, their sense of status, their sense of world historical significance um, is linked to empire because it means empire is power, it means they matter. Um, this is a particularly diseased and extreme variant, uh, but it's the s something one's familiar with. Is he longing to be an emperor? Look, he's not longing to be an emperor in the sense that I talked about emperors in my book. Mm. You know, the world which I talked about is over in the sense that we are never, we do not see now and we are never going to see again vast areas of the world ruled by sacred hereditary monarchs, dynasties, who are, you know, well, not just sacred, but also sovereign. That's gone. Um, but the name of the game in terms of power uh, now as in the past is to control vast resources uh, ever since the last decades of the 19th century, the key has been to combine the power and the resources of empire with the solidarity and the legitimacy which goes with being an, a, a nation. Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult balance to achieve. The Chinese have done it better than anyone else. Um, they are the oldest imperial tradition. Um, they are, in some senses, still an empire, but 92% of the population is Han Chinese. Um, that helps to explain why they are so powerful and dynamic. What is what is notable, perhaps, is the is the violence and aggression that is usually characteristic of the kind of demise of an empire, as as we've mentioned, but also how how rarely that actually solves any of the of the disputes that that have, have come about at the point of demise. We mentioned some of the conflicts that are still ongoing to this day. Violence and war doesn't tend to solve these things particularly efficiently. No, it seldom uh, solves them definitively. Uh, though you could say that the German uh, bid to reassert empire in Europe after the collapse of 1918 of the two German empires, the, the Hohenzollerns and the Habsburgs, was resolved by war in 1945 mm -hmm. and has never come back on the agenda and probably never will. But, you know, Europe at the moment faces precisely the dilemma. On the one hand, if it's Gainter 
count if it's not going to be marginalised in the big issues we face, such as climate change or even just trade negotiations. You need to pool the resources of a continent. How do you do that in the continent which created modern nationalism and is still very much, you know, enthralled mm -hmm. with it, is to put things brutally, or I mean, however you want to put it. Yeah. It's the big dilemma. I, I suppose uh, perhaps in our in our language, my, my, my mind immediately goes to kind of authoritarian leaders. And to, to is there a distinction between an authoritarian leader and uh, an emperor or somebody who wants to be an emperor? The main distinction I think you would have to make between a contemporary strongman and many, not all, of the emperors in history, certainly emperors from long-established dynasties, um, you know, they were legitimate. Uh, their power was rooted in religious uh, principles which were very widely accepted. They were deemed to be the deputies of some version of heaven. Mm. Uh, they kept heaven and earth in balance, you know, in the, in the Confucian idea of anyway. Um, there is a difference between that and a, a contemporary strongman who basically, you know, usually has to pretend to believe in democracy or, you know, he, he, he cannot in the same way legitimise his rule, let alone pass it along to an equally legitimate heir. Yes, that's an That is point. a distinction. Yes. That is a distinction. Of course, if you're looking at the founders of dynasties, um, in the old days, then they had to gain legitimacy. You know, they would be more like a contemporary strongman. Mm, that's an interesting one. Uh, when we look around the world then, we, we've mentioned Putin, of course. Mm. Uh, we, we've mentioned China as well. Are these the examples of, of I suppose, uh, the, the closest thing we have to, to kind of modern day empires? It all depends on your definition. Right. I mean, to me, the most <laughs> basic go. definition of empire is vast scale in terms of territory and resources, multi-multi-ethnicity, and above all, power. Mm. Power meaning not just hard power, but also soft power. Mm. You know, the power of your culture was often absolutely fundamental to the long-term impact of, of, of empire. That's obvious enough. I mean, among, for instance, the empire, emperors I look at in my book are the early caliphs of the Umayyad, you know, Abbasid dynasties, and Genghis Khan. Well, Genghis Khan ruled over a bigger empire if you're looking at just territory. His military machine was more formidable. But of course, in the long run, the caliphate had hugely more impact on world history. Mm. We are still living with the consequences of, uh, you know, the creation and survival of an Islamic community, which probably wouldn't have happened without the two, uh, the, the two great caliphal dynasties. So that tells you something about soft power. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what the, the, the caliphate united were the two strongest forces that one could imagine in that era. Mm. One, the power of military nomads, you know, who yeah. were always superior to sedentary societies in purely military terms, with the enormous force of a new salvation religion, which apart from else united all the tribes mm. of Arabia. So, you know, one is dealing with complex historical processes, but nevertheless, I mean, one of the, again, I mean, just talking about the caliphate, you know, Putin is one example of how my time, you know, real old-fashioned empire still resonates mm. in today's world. Look at him making some of his speeches. Who is the statue behind his right shoulder? It's Catherine II, mm -hmm. who conquered the areas which are now in dispute. You know, New Russia, as the, the Russians used to call it. But actually, go back two and a half thousand years you know, to the origins of Buddhism. Without Emperor Ashoka, the Mauryan emperor in the 3rd century B BCE, uh, Buddhism would have remained a relatively small North Indian sect and would probably have disappeared. Thanks more than en to any other indiv individual to him, uh, it has become, you know, the dominant religion and huge cultural force across most of Asia. It's so fascinating to consider the echoes of things that have gone, things of history that are still very apparent now. Um, you've written about it wonderfully. It's In the Shadow of the Gods is the name of the book, The Emperor in World History. It's by Dominic Levin, and we've been very grateful for your time. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh,